Okay, we'd like to welcome you back to our current event and weekly Bible study for 82408. 82408, and this is part one of our particular study we're doing today, and it is entitled The Spiritual Danger of Martial Arts. Now, this is something that I've had many requests, and there's people that are adamant on both sides of this particular issue. And what we're going to try to do today is take a look at the subject from a scriptural standpoint. And the thing that we really have to do in regard to looking this, at this subject is leave our opinion, check our opinion at the door. Okay? Some verses to consider before we get started is Proverbs 18.13. And that says, He that answereth the matter, before he heareth it, it is a folly and a shame unto him. So if you've already made up your mind about this, then you've already judged the matter before you've even heard it. Okay, that's a folly and a shame. Galatians 4.16 says, am I, am I therefore become your enemy because I tell you the truth? So these are, we're going to be going over a lot of scriptures today to see if this particular subject lines up with the word of God. This is an uh, article from a Dr. Russell Tardo, uh, The Spiritual Danger of Martial Arts. He starts out by saying, Billy Jack, Bruce Lee, David Carradine's Kung Fu, Chuck Norris, The Karate Kid, Mutant Ninja Turtles... And a host of others have played, uh, made karate a very popular in America. The martial arts were already popular in the Far East when Hollywood glamorized the, fix, the fighting techniques with a string of low-budget, B-rated, successful movies. Although highly fictionalized, they found an eager audience in the Western world. We Westerners took to the movies. Well, we Westerners took an immediate shine to the seemingly indestructible karate practitioner portrayed in the movies. He was independent quiet-spoken, self-confident, fearless, and capable of defeating a veritable army almost single-handedly. Well, what are we dealing with here already? Pride of man? Pride goeth before fall, a haughty spirit before destruction? Karate schools called dojos sprang up in the cities in the U.S. Hundreds of thousands of Americans began their quest for the coveted black belt. Now remember, what started this all out? What was the thing that really got the ball rolling? Hollywood. One of, you know, the most satanic organizations that has ever sprung up on the planet, that's been been used to defile particularly American humanity and now a lot of other parts of the world. So that was the thing that really got the ball rolling in Hollywood. So uh, thousands of Americans began their quest for the coveted black belt, worn only by the martial arts master. From there it wasn't long before the martial arts began seeping into the Christian church. It's like everything else in the Christian church. you got rock and roll, you got martial arts, now you got yoga... You got them. You got them. This whole contemplative uh, New Age Christianity that's just totally seeping through the church. It's just one more thing. It's one more piece of leaven. Sadly, it's been the habit of the church to adopt the fads of the world, and thus many ministries were soon teaching judo instead of Jesus and holding courses in every conceivable form of martial arts. Recently, several specialized ministries have appeared featuring the martial arts. And also combining this with the strongman stunts. The average service held by these Christian karate teams has them breaking bricks, boards, baseball bats, huge blocks of ice, and with their heads, feet, and hands. Phone books and handcuffs are ripped apart, and other things usually associated with Eastern mysticism and the occult, such as nail beds and walking on hot coals, are employed in a spectacular display of speed and strength and skill. Now, I've been there and done that on these. I've been to that whole... I forget what those guys were. Power team. Yeah, I have saw them. I probably saw them twice. I was, when I was younger, I was involved in Taekwondo. Um, we're going to be talking about acupuncture today, or, or, or in the previous studies. I've had a, a lot of experience with that. I've, I've got a lot of background in this stuff myself. So, if we go further, it says ministers around the world have invited these karate teams to hold crusades in their churches, knowing that they will draw a capacity crowd and can be told the good news of Jesus Christ. Well, what, whatever their, their motivation, you know, that's, that's between them and God. While I do not doubt the good intentions and the sincerity of these men, sincerity is not the issue here. Truth is. Okay, so let's just for a moment say, okay, let's say they're all sincere. Now, we know that's not the case, okay? We know that a little leaven leaven up the whole lump, and that the love of money is the root of all evil, and then that, that which is highly esteemed among men is an abomination in the sight of God. And I mean, this martial arts stuff is highly esteemed among men. Okay, let's face it, it is. 
Sincerity is not the issue here, though. Truth is the issue. Now, let's just read a couple verses that relate to that particular thing. Proverbs 14, 12, and 16, 25. You hear me quote this a lot. There is a way which seemeth right unto a man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. There's a lot of people that are involved in martial arts that call themselves Christians, and yes, it seems right unto them. But the Bible says the end thereof are the ways of death. Doesn't mean I think you can't be doing this and, and, and you're and automatically you're not saved, okay? I'm not saying that... that I'm, I'm not going to go that far. I'm just saying that this is a tool of Satan that's being used to deceive a lot of people. Jeremiah 17, 9 and 10 says, The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? I, the Lord, search the heart. I try the reins, even to give every man according to his ways and according to the fruit of his doings. So the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Proverbs 18.2 says, All the ways of a man are clean in his own eyes, but the Lord weigheth the Spirit. So, the people that participate in this, every single time, they're clean in their own eyes. But it really doesn't matter what we think about ourselves. It matters when we look at the Word of God, what the reflection is there. The Word of God is like a mirror. And, and we're going to see that this particular thing, regarding martial arts, is weighed and found wanting. Mark 7.13 says, Making the word of God of none effect through your tradition. What is martial arts? It's a tradition. It's an oriental tradition that's been handed down over hundreds of years. And it will make the word of God of none effect to a certain degree. The Bible also says that no flesh should glory in his presence. What is martial arts all about? Well, at the higher levels, particularly when we talk about these strength shows that we just mentioned, it is flesh glorying in the presence of God. We go back to the article, so it says, Sincerity is not the issue, truth is, and the former is never a substitute for the latter. So while the motivation behind such performances may be, may be good, the Bible believer is eventually forced to question whether such displays are biblical. That's all that really matters. We know they're popular, but are they compatible with Christianity? Well, okay, ask yourself this question. Imagine how absurd it would be to have Jesus Christ or the Apostles sponsoring or endorsing one of these strongman strength shows, which I've went and saw. I mean, and literally when they're done, the stage looks like it's, it's just, you know, had some 20-car collision on it after they get done breaking the bats, breaking the ice, breaking the boards, breaking the handcuffs. It looks like, you know, pandemonium and chaos. You know, everything should, the Bible says everything should be done in decency and in order. There's nothing in decency and in order about one of these events. It's all about getting and inciting the carnality of the flesh. Wow, look how strong he is. Working you up into this emotional fervor and froth to force you into some type of emotional decision that you'll make. I know I've been there, and I've seen people around me that were unsaved that went there to these types of things. And yes, they were caught up in the moment. But there was no change whatsoever. There was no lasting change. It's just like the Christian rock concerts. It's no different. I can remember at the Pentecostal church that I was at, and I know I've told this story before, but for the new listeners, I'll tell this. We, I was at this hyper-charismatic church, and they had this real popular rock band at the church, Christian, Christian quote, rock band. And they were saying, and I was one of the people in the ministry there, and they needed people backstage after the event was over, the Christian rock concert, so that when they had their supposed altar call, there, there was going to be all these people to pray with them and you know lead them to the Lord. Well, okay, the Christian rock concert went off without a, without a hitch, and afterward there was all this mass exodus of people that were behind stage, and yes, we were praying for them. And I thought to myself, while this was happening, I thought, oh man, this church is never going to be the same. We're going to have three or four hundred new converts just from this one Christian rock concert, at least, that got saved. And I thought, oh man, this next Sunday is going to be unbelievable. It's going to be the best Sunday ever. Craziest thing, when the next Sunday came around, we actually had less people than we usually have. There were, I did not recognize one new person that had actually come to the church that supposedly had gotten saved. What was the fruit? Was it lasting? No. It wasn't, it wasn't anything that was lasting. It was just purely this emotional experience, which is what the world and the devil loves to supply. But 
the fruit was never... And imagine Jesus Christ or the apostles sponsoring one of these martial arts events. Or, or them doing something similar to this. Like, you know, the Apostle Paul busting ice cubes and, in, 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 um, you know, destroying boards and, and doing all these strengths of feet. Can you imagine how absurd that sounds in the Bible? Or the Bible relaying those stories? Wouldn't that, like, if you read that in the Bible, wouldn't that be like, wow, this is really weird. This doesn't seem to line up with the rest of the Bible, with the meek and contrite and humble spirit and, you know, trembling at his word and, and not, you know, making a show for man and, and no flesh would glory in his presence and all these things and everything should be done in decency and order and that we should be sober and vigilant. All of these Bible verses spring to mind. There would be, you know, obviously it, that's absurd, but yet it's okay and condoned in the modern day church. More to the point, is the martial arts demonstration a biblical, scriptural platform from which to preach Christ? While one may argue that Christ could be preached from any platform, we must also bear in mind that the method we employ affects the, method, the message we preach. I mean, if I come out and I'm in satanic garb, I'm dressed like the high priest of Satan, isn't that going to affect the message that I preach, the platform from which I come to you? For instance, how can someone preach, turn the other cheek, when teaching, you know, kick them in the other cheek? How can one preach love your enemies while teaching how to hurt them? You see, when the method contradicts the message, it destroys the credibility. And seeing phone books ripped apart by scantily clad muscle men who bob, who bob their head up and down, gathering momentum and mental strength as he prepares to crash his head into a thousand pound block of ice, it can't possibly prepare the heart for a message about a meek Savior who extolled humility and scorned self-exaltation. I think this guy brings up some really awesome points. Now, I had several requests from people over the last many months asking me to do a, a teaching on this. So this isn't something I just got, you know, mad about the other week. I've been preparing this for preparing to do this for a long time, and there's been a lot of requests from people. Now, this teaching is going to infuriate some of the people on my email list. And again, I ask you, am I therefore become your enemy because I tell you the truth? Some of these people have been begging me to do this teaching. I don't want to say begging, but they've been really wanting me to do this teaching because they have relayed to me how adversely it affected them while they were involved in it and, and how it spiritually was affecting them. This is what they're telling me. Not what I'm just making up here. So I've got a lot of, in other words, testimonies uh, confirming what we're talking about here today. While stunts such as these that we just described might attract an impressionable group of young people to sign up for a karate class, it is difficult to see how it will cause them to want to enroll in a Sunday school class. Here's another verse to think about. When you have all these guys and these muscle men and, and, and these karate demonstrations and they're going up there and it's all about the flesh and it's all about the pride of life and all this stuff and they're busting ice and breaking ball bats and all these other things. The Bible says in Jeremiah 48.10, Cursed be he that doeth the work of the Lord deceitfully. Cursed be he. What are they doing? Well, we're doing the work of the Lord. Bless God, these ball bats and these ice things and that we're doing this to reach the lost for Christ. You're doing the work of the Lord deceitfully. It's not the way God said to do it. Meek and contrite spirit, trembling in his word, you know, all of these other Bible verses we mentioned, and we're going to mention many more. So please do not misunderstand. This is not an outsider's debate against something that I know not of. Now remember, this is from this Dr. Tardo. I was once among the millions of Americans who sought the black belt. I dedicated almost five years of my life to its pursuit. Me, personally, I was in Taekwondo. I got up to, like, green belt first degree or something when I was a child, kid, or I don't know. I was probably, like, 11 or 12. And I tell you what, looking back, there was nothing Christian about that. Now, granted, this guy wasn't a Christian, but it was, you know, it was, um, had I stayed in it, looking back, it would have never, ever led me to Christ. Ever. It was the exact polar opposite. So many of the tenants, the tenants of this particular, uh, I was in Taekwondo, and, you know, I, I look back at, like, my, my instructor, uh, we called him Sabu Nim, the guy was Young Nam Lee was his name, he was an 8th degree black belt from Korea, he was one of the only 8th or ninth degree black belts in the world, the guy was mean, I mean, he was, the only time you ever saw that guy happy, 
I remember this from a kid. Now, granted, this was the impression this left on me. The only time I ever saw that guy happy was on test day, when we were going to go get our next belt. You know why? Because that was the day he collected all the money. Because you had to pay to get the belt. So he had literally 100 people paying money on that given day. That was the day he was always happy. Oh, yeah, yeah, and And you would almost pass just because you paid the money. It wasn't really about, in that regard, not to say I didn't earn what I was doing, but it was very much about the money. Because he realized that if a lot of people weren't passing, they would get frustrated and not want to come back. But that guy was mean, and he, had, he encouraged... I can remember many fights that not only myself, but other people were involved in there that turned pretty violent. I can remember a couple that I was in, and uh, I've always struggled with my temper as it is. And you get kicked in the face. I remember I had a guy one time spar me, and he shook my hand. He was a friend of mine. He punched me right in the face. And I came out, and I kind of cleaned his clock. And he went on. And never forget this. He went on to, uh, him and his brother, to be like really, really, really high-level black belts. And he went on. His name was Jamie. He was in a bar one night, and some guy came up to him. This was locally where I live. And did something or, or made him mad. And he gave him an open palm right to the nose. Pushed his, his, it's a particular move. You can kill somebody. Kill the guy right there in the bar. He's probably in prison to this day. Hey, that's great fruit. They went, to, they went on to, to um, get into all kind of trouble. Pride of life. They went way beyond what they were doing there at the particular place that I was at. But see, that's the, you know, I look at this whole thing and I've got a lot of history too. And, and looking back, it's, it's not good. Not good what I see. So this particular man writing the article said he dedicated almost five years of his life to this pursuit. And then someone intervened, and it was Jesus Christ. When I received Christ, no one had to tell me that karate was wrong or unchristian. I just knew it automatically. But yet, we have so many people that are involved in martial arts, and they see absolutely nothing wrong with it, and they will defend it tooth and nail. They'll defend it more than they will the Bible a lot of the times, from what I've seen. And I'm going to tell you about one of the experiences I had a little bit later with this in the church. He said, that was almost 20 years ago. I knew it automatically that it was wrong. Now I am saddened by a generation of Christians who see no conflict between martial arts and Christ. They naively believe that karate, that karate's source can be divorced from its practice. This is, we shall see, faulty reasoning. The fact is, all the martial arts were birthed from an anti-Christian womb. That is why their philosophy attacks the teachings of Jesus at every hand. Did you know that? The very philosophies that the martial arts is based upon attacks Jesus Christ and the Word of God. Shouldn't that be a red flag? And their practice conflicts with his example. I discovered that the martial arts were not harmless practices, but with grave spiritual dangers lurked at every corridor of their use. The particular style I studied was Korean Hapkido, but all of the styles spring from the same source. Remember that. All of the style. Because you could say, yeah, it applies to karate, but it doesn't apply to... Hapkido, or Taekwondo, or whatever. That's, that's, I'm sorry. But that argument does not hold up at all. They all spring from the same source. Thus, it is out of joint, genuine concern that I feel obligated to make every Christian aware of these spiritual dangers of the martial arts. This is acting as a watchman. If, you, if the watchman see at the sword coming and warn not the city, then his blood will be required at the watchman's hands. This is what we're doing today. We're warning people that may be caught up into this as I was at one time. So, the first thing we'll be talking about, martial arts all originate in false religion. Funk and Wagnall says, quote, the art of karate is more than a thousand years old and originated in the ancient Orient first as a monastic training, like the monks, monastic training, not, not Catholic. Okay, we're talking Oriental version of that. First in monastic training and later as a defense by the Chinese peasants against armed bandits. Karate developed much later than its forerunners, the Chinese Kung Fu, which is more diverse and holds more closely to its Buddhist philosophical roots. They, now, again, the people, the, the martial artists, the people that write about karate and all these different martial arts openly admit of the 
intimate relationship that the martial arts has with all of these other false religions like Taoism and Buddhism, things of this nature, it's, it's, you cannot separate the two. That in and of itself should be enough for us to flee. Okay, I'm going to give you hopefully tons of reasons today to flee all appearance of evil because that's what you would be doing if you walk away from the martial arts. Definitely erring on the side of safety is walking away here. Bob Larson, a respected Christian author and researcher, says, The original religious philosophy of Kung Fu dates back to 2696 B.C., where it was rooted in the occultic forms of divination known as I Ching and the Book of Changes. And it says it right here. I mean, it's rooted. Well, if the root be rotten, the whole... Everything that comes from the root is rotten. The head be sick, the whole body's sick. If the foundations be destroyed, what can the righteous do? It's rooted in occultic forms of divination. Lyle Tzu, I know I'm butchering the words, I'm sorry. I don't speak fluent Chinese and Korean. The Chinese sage born in 1604 BC further added the demonic embellishments. His teachings were set forth in 5280 in a 5,280-word manuscript called Tao Te Ching, often simply called the Tao, or the Way. He taught that salvation could not be found in prayer, but rather by the observance of nature. With the adoption of Taoism, Kung Fu developed into a complex system of occult practices that included contemplation and breathing exercises. Sounds like the same thing that's going on in, in, the, uh, in the church today. That they're bringing this stuff into the church, this contemplative Christianity, where the New Age is permeating into the church. It's very, very similar to this stuff. The common doctrine of the, it's called KI, made acupuncture an aid in the quest for health and physical development. We're going to see later, um, next week, how acupuncture um, is involved with this, and how that's something you want to avoid as well. Acupuncture is an aid for quelf. Uh, health quest and physical development. Eventually, this led into a search for the mysteries of alchemy. Further tainted Kung Fu with overtones of demonism. In other words, it started out corrupt and it just got more and more corrupt. This is the way Satan always does things. The next development in the history of Kung Fu took place when a monk named, oh boy, Bad Hid Harama brought Buddhism to China in the 6th century AD when he discovered the monks sleeping during his lectures. He must have been not, you know, really exciting lecturer, sorry. Uh, he introduced exercises to assist them in meditation. Later known as I Chin Satura, it combined Kung Fu with the philosophical principles of Zen to develop a highly sophisticated form of weaponless defense. The monks at Shaolin Temple became famous for their savage abilities of defense employed wherever they were attacked in the course of pilgrimages. Now, this is one of the earliest movies that Hollywood made about these Shaolin monks. Eventually, two schools of practice evolved of these Shaolin monks. The Chun Fi, or Kung Fu, based upon the hard external school of Buddhism and the soft internal school of Taoism or Taoism, as the martial arts, it's spelled T-A-O-I-S-I-M, as the martial arts spread beyond the monastery to the fields of war, some of the religious flavor was lost. But the essential undergirding pagan principles have never been completely overshadowed, even to this day. Christians who participate in martial arts and insist that they do not include any forms of occultism in their practice still cannot de deny its patently pagan roots. And again, if the head be sick, the whole body's going to be sick. If the foundations be destroyed, what can the righteous do? There's another verse to consider. Hopefully what I've already just told you, if you weren't... If you were to look at this, and you look at the tenets of the martial arts, and compare it with the Bible, there's a lot of conflicting things we've already mentioned. Whereas the Bible says in 1 Corinthians 14.33, For God is not the author of confusion, but of peace as in all churches of the saints. God is not the author of confusion. So if you're confused about something, God's not the author of it, okay? I mean, this does not line up with the Word of God. Ephesians 5.11 But have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness. That's what we're talking about today. We're not supposed to have fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness. But rather, reprove them. That's what we're doing. We're reproving them. We're exposing them. We're having no fellowship. We're not supposed to be unequally yoked together with unbelievers either, right? 
Well, that's what you're doing if you're, if you're in some martial art class, even if it's some Christian martial art class. Where is the foundation of that particular martial arts that you're studying? Where is that? Okay? Well, it's rooted in paganism. You are still unequally yoked together with unbelievers because you're adopting unbelievers' um, training methodologies, and that's what you're following. So there's a problem there, too. Matthew 24, 24, regarding their times what we're living in, if it were possible, they shall deceive the very elect. This is just one more way Satan is deceiving people. Just one of the many. 2 Corinthians 2, 11, here's a big one. Lest Satan should get an advantage of us, for we are not ignorant of his devices. This is, isn't that what we're talking about today? There's so many people that Satan that call themselves Christians, has gotten an advantage of because they're ignorant of his devices. They're also being destroyed for lack of knowledge. Hosea 4.6 So again, hopefully I've given you enough scripture at this point to, to take a hard look at this. Now, if a corrupt tree cannot produce good fruit, according to Matthew 7.17 7, and 18, how can we possibly believe that the rotten core of occultism lying at the root of martial arts does not taint and pervert them? The Bible does not tell us to embrace the occult, but to flee from it. Romans 13.12 says, Let us therefore cast off the works of darkness, and let us put on the armor of light. We're supposed to cast off the works of darkness, to flee all appearance of evil. How can you be involved in martial arts and, not be, flee and, and be fleeing all appearance of evil? Because a lot of people would look at that from a secular standpoint and say, hey, there's Mr. Christian over there and he's breaking boards and he's doing a sparring practice and he's kicking people's, you know, behind and he's calling himself a Christian. How is that fleeing all appearance of evil? Do you see the contradictions you run into here? Martial arts, here's another thing to bring up, the martial arts all have an underlying occult philosophy. In martial arts, the practitioner exercises mind over matter, through, and through meditation taps into the consciousness of the great power. Surprisingly, many Christians miss the connection between karate and the occult. They see it as mere physical exercise, but they are blinded to its spiritual and philo philosophical aspects, all born of the ancient Orient. Proper frame of mind is essential to karate practice. In order to break boards, one must focus. This is called kaim. That is, he must see through the boards. See his fist emerging through the other side of the boards. This is the occult practice of visualization and mind over matter. Now, again, you could visualize something as far as a goal and these types of things. That doesn't necessarily have to be occult. But this is a different thing we're talking about here. The same is true for shattering bricks or ice. He must empty his mind of the thought of either pain or failure and concentrate all the energy of his body on a specific target. In entering such a mental state, the practitioner willingly or not, has crossed over into the sinister realm of the occult. Matsui, or Matt, Mas, I can't even say this guy's name, I'll be honest. Just say Matsui Oyama, one of the world's most renowned karate experts, said, quote, and this is what he's saying, not what I'm saying, always more vital to karate than techniques or strength is the spiritual element that lets you move and act with complete freedom. Now this is a high-level kingpin karate guru guy. He says the spiritual element is always more vital to karate than techniques or strength. Spiritual. In striving to enter the proper frame of mind, Zen meditation is of great importance. But we say that this meditation involves a state of impassivity and complete lack of thought. We mean that through meditation we can overcome emotion and thinking and give freer reign to our innate abilities than ever before. The man who wants to walk the way of karate cannot afford to neglect Zen and the spiritual training. End of quote. It can't, you cannot separate the two. Now, I've had a lot of people email, oh no, we separate the two. We don't, we don't get in any of the occult aspects of this at all. Well, that's between you and God, okay? But I'm just telling you right now, <laughs> I don't see how you can separate the two. Now, when he says that you have to, uh, the meditation before they're going to do these particular things involves a state of impassivity and complete lack of thought. Where have I heard this before? Well, this is what the New Agers do when they empty their mind and get in touch with whoever they're trying to get in touch with, whether it's their, if they're trying to channel some demonic spirit or get in touch with some supposed ascended master or do this or do that. Satan loves for you to get into this mantra meditation state and empty your mind 
Because I believe it opens you up to demonic infestation. This is why Satan is so big on this. The Beatles, when they came um, in the late 60s or whatever, they were the ones that introduced America in a big way to the concept of transcendental meditation through that yogi guy. And a lot of people are going to go to hell because of the Beatles. I've seen a whole study on how they were integrally tied in with this guy and how that influenced so many of the songs that they wrote and so much of the propaganda that they put out. They were as Christ-hating as you could be. The Beatles were. And that all had to do, a lot of it had to do with this transcendental med meditation. If we go further, as Oyama said, this guy that we just quoted, this karate master, he said Zen, which is occultism, is an essential ingredient to karate. In fact, it is precisely the occult connection through which the karate master derives his uncanny powers, such as catching bullets in his teeth. Now, I've never seen that one done. I, I, that's one I'd really like to see. Doug, you can catch bullets in your teeth, can't you? Okay. A anyway, uh, pulling punches... Oh, here's a good one. Pulling punches short of striking the body with the effect still felt. Whoa! So, in other words, you go to punch somebody, but you don't actually hit them, but the effect is still felt. This is getting into a lot of the stuff you see on TV nowadays, like with heroes and all these superhuman shows, these supposed people that are going to be the saviors of all mankind. We have the star children and the indigo children. Now we have these people that have these extraordinary powers. It's all demonic. It's all witchcraft is all it is. But they're supposedly going to be the saviors of all mankind. And what's going to ultimately end up happening is when the Antichrist makes his arrival with the Ascended Masters, they're going to point to them and say, oh, there's where we get our power from. So if you want to be like us, you've got to go to him. Guaranteed. That's what's coming. What's, the, what's another thing? They can, well, they can exercise psychokinetic power sometimes, moving objects by mental forces alone. Now again, the further you go up in the belt system, whether you're in karate or taekwondo or whatever, the more powers that you, ob you obtain. Sometimes these actually get into the realm of these types of powers that we're talking about here today. Now, how is all this done? The, when you get into, I mean, somebody could catch a bullet with his teeth, or, or um, punches pulling short of striking the body, but with the effect still felt. Let's talk about that one. How is that done? It's done, whether they want to admit it or not, by summoning demons in order to do these feats and accomplish their dirty work. Who does it glorify? Jesus Christ glorifies self. The Bible says again, no flesh should glory in my presence. Jesus, God said that in his word. This is a common witchcraft recruiting tool. I've seen scenarios where somebody that was involved in witchcraft, they would bring the, the person they wanted to convert, and they would say, hey, listen, you know, I've, I've got powers. I'm, I'm a witch, or I'm a warlock, or whatever. And I've got powers. And, and, they, and you know, they would say, okay, let me demonstrate my powers to you. And if, if you, if you want to join us, you'll have these type of powers too eventually. And essentially, they would have something like where maybe they would levitate, or maybe they would levitate like a chair or table off the ground. What is that? They're summoning demons through witchcraft in order to raise that object. Demons have power. Fallen angels have power, okay? They can actually move physical objects. This is why when you watch these ghost stories and stuff like this, oh, the, the bookcase moved or, or a book flew across the room. These are demons doing this. Are those shows ever glorifying Jesus Christ? No. They can call them ghosts or poltergeists or whatever they want to. They're demonic, evil entities. Okay, that's what we're dealing with. And they do have power to a certain extent to be able to move physical objects. If Satan can get you to go to hell because he rose some table off the ground five inches, don't you think he's going to raise them all day long? And we know that's the chief way that the Antichrist is going to deceive the masses through the miracles and the lying signs and wonders. That's the, that's the very chief tool that he's going to use to deceive all humanity. And it's a common witchcraft recruiting tool. Well, it's a common recruiting tool to get you to go into the martial arts. You see these, these big strength demonstrations. They're breaking boards. They're breaking concrete. They're doing whatever. And, and, you know, particularly men, we want to have that machismo thing going on. And we want to be able to do that and, and, and be really strong and tough. And so that appeals to our masculine nature. And we want to go, and we want to break boards, and we want to be strong and tough like that. It's a witchcraft recruiting tool, is what it is. This is what we're doing here. So if you had somebody that, that supposedly delivered a punch, he didn't hit the guy, but the effect was still felt, that would be much more awe-inspiring 
than if he actually punched the person and the effect was felt. That would get into the whole mystical realm of, wow, he's got actually powers now that are doing this. I want those powers. I want to be like the Most High. I want to ascend under the sides of the North. That's what Satan said. That's what Lucifer said when he first fell. That's where it all started. He got jealous. He wanted to be like that. The pride. See, pride blinds you. The opposite of pride is humility, humbleness, a meek and contrite spirit, and fearing God. It's the opposite polar end. So, just some things to think about here. Furthermore, this o Oyama, this, this high-level, world's most renowned karate expert, said, quote, Though it seems impossible, with karate, you can actually snap off the top of a beer bottle with, with your bare knife hand. Now, that's something I've always aspired to. I don't know about you, Lisa, but I, I, you know, what's not to like about that? You don't need a bottle opener anymore. You, know, you can be manly. He said, starting again, he said, Mastering the fundamentals and unflagging constant daily spiritual and bodily training, he's saying it's a constant daily spiritual and bodily training. It's the only way you can achieve to these levels. See, Satan is going to make you jump through Tons and tons and tons and tons of hoop in, hoops in order to get his carrots. Okay, that's how Satan is. So it's a constant daily spiritual and bodily training. He will make, it says, will make the impossible possible for anyone. So in other words, anybody can do it if you put your mind to it. Certainly, breaking the neck off a beer bottle and leaving the bottle standing is difficult. This is this guy quoted here. But constant karate training can help you develop the speed and strength that will surpass all common sense. I mean, I, where do I sign up? So, Oyama has also engaged in unarmed battle with bulls. Now, Nonetta, you did that last week, didn't you? Out here and back. He's, he's dealt in unarmed battles with bulls, this guy. Guy's an animal. I mean, what can you say? I mean, he's macho as it gets. In his lifetime, he dealt sudden death to three bulls. <laughs> can you imagine? i never seen this before. He broke the horns off 48 others. He karate chopped the horns and busted the horns off 48 bulls and he killed three of them. I'm telling you, man, this, this appeals to the, the machismo side of the male psyche. Doesn't get any better than this. Now, I'm, obviously, I'm being facetious here, but I'm talking about this is how the typical male thinks, okay? I'm being honest. <laughs> obviously, such amazing feats of, of strength spring from no mere human source. This is the truth. He doesn't draw. He's not. Sorry, I don't believe it. There's something way more going on if he's killing bulls and breaking their horns off and the guy's still living. What does this also lead to? Man worship. You have a guy like this, Oyama, this Master Sensei Oyama, and he's doing this stuff, and all of his disciples, and I mean that literally, disciples, because this is a religion we're dealing with here. Religion's absolutely tied in with He even said it. Spiritually, you can't separate the two. They look to him, and they revere this man, and... It's a form of man worship. And he's all more than willing to receive their accolades and their pride. And, 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 and pride wells up in him. Jeremiah 17.5, though, says, Cursed be the man that trusteth in man, and that maketh flesh his arm, and whose heart departeth from the Lord. How much more could you make flesh your arm than if you were looking up to this guy like this, Oyama? You're making flesh your arm. You're, you're, you're relying on flesh. What can I do? But it said, Cursed be the man that does that. Because your heart will depart from the Lord. Even if you started out, let's say, you're on fire for Christ, but you got into this, you're going to have to at some point choose whom this day, who you're going to serve. Is it going to be Christ or is it going to be karate? Furthermore, there is a form of divination or fortune telling or knowledge of future events that begins to operate in those who advance in the karate disciplines. Haidetaka... Nishiyama and Richard C. Brown in their book Karate, The Art of the Empty Hand Fighting said, quote, At an advanced level, it is even possible for a karate expert to sense the movements of his opponents before they take place. Hmm, this is like divination. Though such divining is not an uncommon practice in occultism, any matter of it is not only forbidden by God, but is, it is an abomination unto him. 
Where does it say that? Leviticus 19.26, Deuteronomy 18.10, Isaiah 19.3, Acts 16.16. Thus, to deny the occult source and presence in karate is to deny the obvious. So additionally, martial arts practitioners traffic in other aspects of pagan, idolatrous religions. Walking on hot coals, lying on nail beds, which practices are linked to Buddhism, Hinduism, and not Christianity. And again, who's being glorified here? It's self. Self-exaltation. Even the term martial arts itself derives itself from the arts of war, deriving from Mars, the ancient Roman god of war. Martial arts, M-A-R, deriving from Mars, the ancient god of war. Okay? Thus, it is very, its very title presupposes violence and aggression. How can a disciple of Christ also practice the disciplines of the ancient pagan god of war? How can one who practices Christianity also practice blatant occultism? You cannot drink of the cup of the Lord and the cup of devils. You cannot be partakers of the Lord's table and the table of devils. 1 Corinthians 10.21 This is a philosophy... This is the philosophy you will learn in karate if, if you go into it. Turning your cheek or kicking your adversary's cheek. Which one do you do? Matthew 5.39 Blessing them that curse you and doing good to them which despitefully use you. Or, you know, beating them up. That, was, that verse was from Matthew 5.44 After all, did Jesus teach and set an example of self-denial or self-defense? The martial arts glorify the flesh. A few, a few pertinent questions are in order here. If we dedicate ourselves to a diligent um, bodybuilding, will our great physique draw the loss to Christ? Uh, trust me, I've been down that road with the bodybuilding thing, and <laughs> it is the most self-centered sport on the planet. Absolutely, unequivocally, totally. I did a bodybuilding competition in 1992 when I was in chiropractic college. I did Mr. Atlanta. And I'm telling you, it was the most self-centered time of my life ever. Probably one of the most miserable times because it's one of the hardest things you can possibly ever do is to try to maintain a lot of muscle mass and get down to a low body fat. It's, but it's, I can look back and say it was the most self-centered time of my life ever. Bar none, ever. So, granted, I was not saved. It was quite a bit, not quite a bit, but it was before I got saved, but I, I can weigh in on that one a little bit as well. So if, if so, then do men of a greater statue like Goliath, who follow false religions, have a distinct advantage over Christians of smaller size? Just questions to ask yourself. Will their huge size enable them to convert more of their religion, more to their, their religion than we can to ours, simply because they are bigger than we? Was then the Apostle Paul's ministry complete failure because he was actually short? So, Furthermore, how is Christ glorified by the stunts of physical strength? Again, this breeds pride. Pride goes before a fall and a haughty spirit before destruction. No one in history was stronger than Samson, yet even his magnificent feats of strength did not result in the conversion of a single Philistine. He tore off, he tore off not mere handcuffs, but the gigantic gates of Gaza, laid them on his shoulders and deposited them on, hilltop, on a hilltop miles away, yet... Even this feat did not bring a single Philistine to repentance and faith in God of Israel. As far as we know, the Bible didn't record it if it did. This being true, how are we to believe that the kicking of a few bricks and breaking a few boards will somehow cause a wholesale repentance among the unsaved? Again, do we have any scriptural precedents for this? No. Do we have any... Um, biblical precedents from let's looking back to the martyrs. I'm sure the martyrs um, during the like the Spanish Catholic Inquisition. I'm sure they were having little strength and stuntman shows on the side where they were breaking boards and doing all these things to convert the, the converts. I'm sure they were really concerned with that. Okay, and so then we go and we look at the Bible verse where it talks about where John the Baptist said that he must increase and I must decrease. John uh, 3:30. Let us be brutally honest. Who is increasing through martial arts? Isn't it the karate practitioner who is still attracting all the attention, praise, and admiration as he grunts and kicks, jumps, and breaks boards and bricks? Isn't it the strongman who rips apart the phone books and snaps baseball bats who is admired and not Jesus Christ? Isn't it possible that the impressionable young people go home committing the sin that Jude committed in Jude 16 where he said having men's persons in admiration... And God says, no flesh will glory in my presence? I mean, God created the universe. I mean, he, he, he's, he is strength. He is power. 
and we are we are nothing compared to him in regard to that power. Okay, and yet you have these men who go and they seek to be, you know, do all this stuff and glory in their flesh and glory in their carnality. It's a direct contradiction of the Word of God. So, is Christ displaced to the far background while men take center stage in these demonstrations? Is the eternal principle of John 30, 3.30 directly violated? John the Baptist said, He must increase and I must decrease. One of the the best Christians I ever knew, um, I remember when he, get, he lent me this book to borrow um, one time, and on the inside cover, he had written John 33.30, and, and I thought, hmm, and I didn't have the verse memorized, but when I went and looked it up, it, and it was this verse, you know, he must increase, but I must decrease. And really, the reality is, is that's what our Christian walk is all about, if you, if you really want to boil it down. We must decrease to self, and Jesus Christ must increase. Okay, this goes along with Galatians 2.20, where it talks in the Bible about being crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, but Christ liveth within me. So, it's the whole concept of this. And again, it's, it's polar opposite, totally contradictory to the subject we're talking about today with martial arts. How can Jesus Christ increase at the same time men increase? How does the martial art artist or muscle man decrease while strutting his stuff across stage. <laughs> Isn't it obvious that such displays glorify the creature rather than the creator? According to the Apostle Paul, the only glory we should have is in the cross of Christ, Galatians 6.14, and not our own power, ability, or physique. If feats of strength were so effective as a means of reaching the loss, then why can't we find even one remote e reference um, in the New Testament, Paul, Barnabas, Silas, Timothy ever using them in any of their three missionary journeys. Can you imagine? They have their own little strongman thing going. And <laughs> I mean, it sounds so ludicrous, but that's what we do today, and we don't think anything of it. That's what the churches do today. Yet, if you, if you try to even remotely start to even think about this in a biblical context, context you can't help but chuckle, because it's so, it's so crazy. But it's okay today, because evidently we're better than they. We're, we're more spiritual, you know, is, is evidently what the modern day church thinks. And again, that's why the Bible talks about in Revelation 3, regarding the Laodicean church, that they're neither hot nor cold, but they're lukewarm and they're blind, and they can't see. Yet they, they think that they're rich and increased in goods and in need of nothing, but they're actually blind and pitiful and naked and wretched in God's eyes, because His ways are not our ways. Now, again, I'm not saying that because I think I'm Mr. Perfect and I've attained all and, and I am the Grand Poobah. I, if I got what I deserved, I would get death. Okay, So let me just state that right off the bat. Paul said, Oh, what a wretch of a man that I am. Who, will sh who shall deliver me from the body of this death? The things that I should do, that I don't do. And the things that I don't want to do, that I do. Okay, That doesn't give us an excuse to use our liberty for an occasion under the flesh that we may sin that grace may be abound. It doesn't give us an excuse to do that. But I can relate to that verse. So, let me just... I'm, I'm not trying to act like I'm Mr. Perfect here today presenting this teaching. So if we go further, it says, Seriously, beloved, can anyone imagine Paul <laughs> on stage at Philippi <laughs> clapping while some Ma Macedonian Muslim breaks a block of ice with his head? I mean, you can't help but laugh when you start talking about this stuff. Oh, boy. That's not the kind of power Paul was interested in. Indeed, he re had he relied on that kind of power, he would have had no power to look the devil in the eye and say and command these in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ to come out of her, according to Acts 16.18. No, the power Paul enjoyed and the power employed by the martial artists are mutually exclusive and God's power will not be seen as long as man's power is in the spotlight. It's true. Worse yet, it is an actual stumbling block cast before the young and the vulnerable. Jesus warned, But who shall offend one of these little ones which believe in me? It were better for him that a millstone were hanged about his neck, and that he were drowned in the, in the, de in the depth of the sea. Woe to the world because of offenses, for it must needs be that offenses come, but woe to that man by whom offenses by whom the offense cometh. Matthew eighteen, six and seven. Those who promote the martial arts in spite of its inherent occultism endanger the very souls of the young and the tender Christians. 
Every stream of martial arts flows from the same polluted river of occultism. To downplay this occult connection, or worse yet, to deny it altogether, while at the same time promoting martial arts, is to throw the Christians to the lions. Now we get really, really serious, because the Bible says, Woe unto them that call evil good and good evil. Well, isn't that what we're doing here when we, when we promote martial arts? If we're a Christian, we're calling good. And even if, okay, let's say, well, yeah, but we're doing it in my church and we're leaving out all the occult aspects of it and we're doing this and that. You know, you're getting somebody involved in something that is incredibly questionable. You could put a Christian veneer on it all day long. It doesn't make it Christian. Okay? And then that, who knows what that person's going to even do in the future. They've already been indoctrinated in it. They've already been introduced to it. They may end up overtly going into you know, the other later. You just don't know. This is not something you want to lead somebody to and have their blood be required at your hands. It's just not something you want to mess with. Innocent young believers are sucked into the deep undercurrents of the Buddhist and Hindu spirituality that permeates the martial arts. Remember, there's a spirit that goes along with this and you're not seeing the spirit. You can say, yeah, we're not doing any of that other stuff. It doesn't really matter what you think. There is a way which seemeth right unto a man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. It doesn't really matter what you think. The spirits are still there. The spirits are still there and influencing you. And if you're participating in these types of things, they are going to influence you and they are going to eventually inhabit you or influence you heavily in your actions. See, because we can't see the spirits though, the demons and the devils... We think, oh, it's okay. We're, 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 we're keeping it away from all this Oriental stuff and all this. You have to look at the foundation. There's no way it can be done. Hopefully we've proven that already. Or at bare minimum, why wouldn't you want to at least err on the side of safety? I mean, hopefully what we've said already, you would want to at least say, you know what, I'm really unsure about this. I need to err on the side of safety. I need to get into the Word of God. For no other reason than that. And that's really the least of all reasons. Hopefully we presented a stronger case. So if we go further, many young believers are sucked into the deep undercurrents of the Buddhist and Hindu spirituality that permeates the martial arts, and many of them never resurface. What if you led somebody into this? You know? They become prey, and the church or individual Christian who initiated them into the martial arts becomes guilty of their blood and responsible for their deception. God will hold them accountable. Now, I'm not saying if you've done this in the past and come out of it and warn people. I'm not talking. I'm talking about if you're actively or have been actively promoting getting people involved in this stuff. Here's another thing to think of. Scripture declares that the Christian weapons are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds, according to Second Corinthians 10:4. And remember how we battle against, how we battle not against flesh and blood, but against princes, principalities, rulers of wickedness in high places, and therefore we're told to put on the full armor of God, breastplate of righteousness, loins girded with truth, feet shot with the preparation of the gospel of peace, putting on the helmet of salvation and taking up the shield of faith and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God, and above all, praying with all supplication. That's our true weapons of warfare and our true protection. But it's a spiritual battle not a physical battle. So, these battles are not fleshly, tangible, or material, since our warfare is a spiritual one against a spiritual adversary, the devil, according to 1 Peter 5, 8 and 9, the devil seeks as a, he's a, as a roaring lion, seeking whom may, he may devour. It says, then obviously the weapons which we fight must resist, and resist must be spiritual, and not carnal or fleshly in nature. Our weapons are the spiritual weapons, of praise, prayer, faith, the word of God, the blood of Jesus Christ, the name of Jesus, the martial arts. Remember, the Bible says, and they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb. This is in Revelation, Tribulation Saints. They overcame him by the blood of the Lamb and the word of their testimony, and they loved their lives not unto the death. That's how we overcome. Now that is diametrically opposed to what we're talking about with martial arts. No, no, you overcome then through your fists and through karate. This type of stuff. It's it's totally the opposite, if you think about it. Martial arts contrarily make fleshly weapons of the head, feet, and hands. Furthermore, employing the martial arts against another person overlooks the fact that our true foes are not human, but spiritual. The spiritual things that you deal with, if you're dealing with a human, it's not so much the human, it's the demons or devils that are guiding that human. So you could literally kill the human, but the demons and devils are still there. They've just went to influence someone else. And that person's burning in hell. 
So again, it's, it's kind of a mindset shift that you have to have here to understand this in totality. Thus, the martial arts are not only a cult, they are carnal. They are carnal means to a carnal end. They gender carnality, such as vanity, pride, strife, self-confidence, vainglory. In fact, we can state unequivocally that virtually every aspect of martial arts is either carnal or occult. For instance, the karate yell employed by the practitioner before striking his victim is intended to instill fear. That is not only carnal, it is diabolical, for God has not given us a spirit of fear but of love, power, and sound mind, these types of things. We're supposed to have the fear of the Lord. The Bible says the fear of man, which is what we're talking about here, the fear of man bringeth a snare. So many people that want that get into this martial arts and get into the whole karate stuff, they're really motivated by the fear of man. They're afraid of what's going to be done to them. Now, granted, I understand that's human nature to a certain extent, but the fear of God is the beginning of wisdom, knowledge, Understanding, the Bible says, the angel of the Lord encampeth around about them that fear him. So if you really want true protection, you need to fear God and not man. The fear of man bringeth a snare. Uh, where it says, God has not given us a spirit of fear, is 2 Timothy 1.7. The karate symbol, present in almost every stream of martial arts, and acupuncture, and many of the things of New Age, is the yin-yang symbol, the ancient religion occult symbol of contrast with good and evil, light and darkness, right and wrong. It's a lie. It's a lie from the pit of hell, the whole yin-yang thing. That's the symbol for Taoism, which is just one more religion that's going to take millions and millions and millions of people to hell. It's another reason you want to avoid it. Martial arts prowess is carnal at best, demonic at worst, and the martial arts philosophy is predominantly spiritual, borrowed from anti-Christian religions such as Buddhism and Hinduism. But these people that participate in this stuff try to say, yeah, but we're using the spiritual aspects for good. We, we, we're, we've put our, our, our Christian veneer and stamp of approval on it. Therefore, it's okay. We all appearance of evil. Thus, in philosophy and in practice, the martial arts are not only a cult, they are carnal. The Bible warns to be carnally minded is death. In Romans 8, 6, by their fruits you shall know them also. While those who promote the Chinese karate terms, teams cite their bountiful fruit as evidence of their legitimacy, a careful scrutiny of this so-called fruit is in order. Much of the time, what is proclaimed to be genuine, God-ordained fruit is really the waxy artificial department store variety. For instance, one church hosted a well-known karate ministry and boasted that their community's entire public school school football team was converted through the martial arts demonstration. Now, hearken back to the testimony I gave about the Christian rock concert at the charismatic church I was at. This is very similar. However, and it's, again, it's the same exact fruit of what I just talked about with the rock concert. However, none of those converts ever as much visited the church that hosted the conference. Right there. And no evidence of fruit has been noted by anyone knowing the football team. Oh, why not? They all got converted at the karate show. No, they really didn't get converted. It was, it was, you know, like, it was a false conversion. It was an emotional, carnal, supposed conversion. It was, there was no lasting fruit at all, obviously. I mean, if the Holy Spirit was living inside every one of those football players, why wasn't there any change? However, none of these converts ever as much as visited the church that hosted the conference, and no evidence of fruit has been noted by anyone knowing the football team. On the other hand, the fruit has been observed after such crusades in the lives of Christians who take martial arts lessons includes. Now, this is fruit that's been observed after a lot of these supposed strongman crusades where they're busting and breaking everything, and in the, the um, parents that have enrolled their children in these martial arts classes, whether, whether they want to call it Christian martial arts or whatever. This, this is some of the fruit. Uh, one, children kicking and punching their brothers or sisters, now that they've learned this new way to, to uh, defend and attack. Uh, another thing, a new interest in violence in Christian homes, violent toys returning to violent movies, and even a desire to inflict violence upon others. While learning of the martial arts, they, they come... With the learning of the martial arts comes the longing to use it, in other words. Hey, I'm learning this stuff, I might as well use it. Another thing, children getting into fights at school, in the neighborhood. Karate students often develop a sense of cockiness and an inflated sense of their self-defense ability, which can lead to trouble. I've seen this. I've definitely seen this. Fights then they formerly would have avoided or walked away from, which is actually a true Christian pattern, now they engage in. More than a few... 
six-month karate experts have developed too late that they know just enough karate to get them hurt. In spite of what the movies show, today's violent street thugs are not likely to be defeated by karate. They have fought many times before, and yes, they've even fought karate men before. So they won't scare with some stance or some yell. In fact, in many cities, jumping into a karate stance will almost guarantee a um, full assault of bullets. Karate offers little defense against automatic weapons. It's a good point. They're not faster than a bullet. Although that one guy did catch the bullets in his teeth, so now maybe he's the exception of the rule now. Okay, so we gotta, you know, he could beat up bulls and catch bullets. Another thing to think about is legitimizing the occult. It is always wrong to use occult practices in a church to legitimize them in the minds of the impressionable. If martial arts are acceptable, so are the attending elements. Occult meditation, firewalking, employing Hindu nail beds, etc. Unfortunately, the martial arts are simply another form of Eastern mysticism that has crept into the Christian church along with other New Age pagan practices and beliefs. Another thing, paranoia. He's speaking from experience. Many karate students often exhibit the exact opposite of what, what Jesus promised his disciples. Instead of um, peace, calm, love, joy, they are consumed with fear, imagining everyone is their potential enemy. This can and does foment in a, to a point of paranoia. I meant, again, the fear of man bringeth a snare. Martial arts does not promote the fear of God. It promotes the fear of man. Another, some other important questions to consider. Does the end really justify the means, or do the means determine the end? Is filling our church auditorium with people a pure enough motive, regardless of the message they see and hear? Obviously not. A little leaven, leaven at the whole lump. Did Jesus seek to only draw lar large crowds? Obviously the answer is no. Several times after performing actual miracles, not mere strongman stunts, he even told people not to even tell others. Remember, many of the greatest miracles were done in relatively private settings, or only before a small number. He walked on water in a solitary place, only before a few. When he turned the water into wine, no one but the servers really knew it. There was no big demonstration. No one called for all to come and see the signs and wonders. Though some of the Lord's healings were done in public, many were performed in relative privacy, like the healing of Jairus' daughter, the deliverance of the gathering, etc., the fact is, when the biggest crowds were present, he would usually teach them, not demonstrate what he could do. Can you imagine, again, Jesus breaking boards and stuff like that? Give me a break. How, how unlikely today, how unlike today's cheap, shallow, circus-like karate demonstrations for Christ? So what about using martial arts as an exercise? Because this is the big justification. This is how they justify yoga as well. And we're going to be talking about yoga next week. Lord willing. Many Christians have been seduced by the exer exercise aspect of karate, yoga, etc. Where will it lead? Eventually, those who embark on the karate journey will inevitably be overcome by spiritual aspects of it as well. The two sides of karate, the physical and the spiritual, are so closely intertwined as to make them inseparable. Absolutely. That's what the karate masters say too. Can't accuse them of being biased. To explore the one is to discover the other. There are enough non-occultic forms of exercise to take advantage of so as to leave us to, so, so as to leave us without excuse here. I mean, in, in other words, there's other ways you could exercise and not have to participate in some occult activity. The whole concept and practice of martial arts contradicts Christianity. It is at once occult, fleshly, man-serving, Christ-denying. It is, in fact, anti-Christian in spirit, philosophy, and practice. Smashing bricks, breaking boards, opposes the example of Christ. The Bible says of him that Christ was of a meek and lowly and a contrite spirit, and that we're supposed to follow that example. He says, come follow me, remember? I'm meek and lowly. The ultimate goal of karate is not mere physical, but spiritual enlightenment occultism. It is a veritable spider's web seeking to ensnare the unwary, the ignorant, and the self-confident who believe they can dabble in the devil's web of occultism and not become its prey. It's impossible to do. Dear reader, please consider these warnings and remember the Apostle Paul's admonishing lest Satan should get advantage of us for we are not ignorant of his devices. 2 Corinthians 2.11 and we're going to end part 1 there and we'll go to part 2 next. We'd like to welcome you back to part three of our current event and weekly Bible study for 82408. And now we're going to specifically talk about karate uh, in this particular segment. And then we're going to transition into one other segment. We'll probably be able to get this all finished up in this part two. 
This article is entitled Karate, Tool for Christian Evangelism or Zen Buddhism. So on the cover of Bob Jones University's spring of 1992 issue, this is 1992, of the BJU Review, is a picture of a black belt karate master and a senior at Bob Jones University, Jim Pitts, in full karate garb. Bible open, giving the invitation, while the rest of the members of Bob Jones University, champions, it was called the Champions for Christ Karate Team. That's the... Bob Jones had their own Champions for Christ karate team. That was an exact quote. They're all kneeling in prayer by their cinder block bricks. On the inside cover is a picture of Mr. Pitts breaking four bricks with his right arm while the other team members are watching with Bibles open. It just This is just unbelievable. The editor of the review declares that, quote, Champions for Christ is one of the many different extension groups that go out from the university each week Bringing the gospel to needy people throughout the Southeast, these extension ministries give all the students the chance to sharpen their soul-winning skills, be an encouragement to others, and use their skills to glorify God. Many other so-called youth and evangelism ministries promote the martial arts as a means of motivating youth in evangelism. Now, if, you, if you're starting at part two here, please go back and listen to part one first, because we've already talked about a lot of these different things here. So, for example, the March 1992 Baptist Bulletin contains an article about a husband and wife, ABWE min missionary team, helping, quote, teenagers understand God's power in their lives by exhibiting the husband's karate skills, such as breaking boards with his hands, demonstrating samurai swords, and nunchucks at, the, at these youth rallies. The missionary team claims to want to help teenagers understand God's power in their lives, and to motivate them to join God in the spiritual battle of the present age. Right. Should have, And again, what kind of spiritual battle? They're encouraging them to be involved in a carnal, physical, self-combative battle, not the type of battle that the Bible says that we're to engage in. We battle not against flesh and blood. The Bible says we battle not against flesh and blood. Well, these karate, Christian karate teams... That's not the message they're sending. You know, they're battling against boards and bricks and mortar and, and other people, potentially. But the Bible says we battle not against flesh and blood, but against princes, principalities, rulers of wickedness in high places. The weapons of, war, of our warfare are not carnal. They're not with hands and fists and feet, or nunchucks, but mighty through the pulling down of strongholds. Again, we covered a lot of this in the last lecture, but I'm, I will refresh some of these things that we need to... No. So, should a Christian's soul-winning skills include karate? And, ki and can that skill be used to glorify God? And what has karate to do with the reality of God's power in a teenager's life? Even though one might find it difficult to see how the so-called skill of karate could or would be used by the Holy Spirit to draw the lost to Christ, the overriding question must be, is there a philosophy opposed to Christianity that is at the root of the karate exhibitions? Obviously, we've already answered that question in the affirmative in the last teaching. We're going to explore that a little bit further now, though. Karate has a un unique and unusual history. It was handed down centuries ago from a Zen master to a Buddhist monk by the word of mouth. Now, that's a good foundation to lay. You know, if the foundation be destroyed, what can the righteous do? So, this word of mouth handing down has always been in strict secrecy. Oh, you mean like all the secret societies that have permeated all through society and that kind of got their start in the Babylonian mystery religions with Nimrod and Semiramis and all that stuff? Yes, it's an offshoot. If you really want to boil it down, it is an offshoot to that. Strict secrecy, Gnosticism, this hidden knowledge that you must attain. It's no different than any other false religion. Because it is a religion and it has much religion incorporated into it, as we've seen. Even today, everything done in karate can be traced back to some, the, some of the principles of Zen Buddhism. An Indian Buddhist priest named Bodhid Harama in the 6th century AD in China synthesized karate techniques and yoga meditation in order to unite mind, spirit, and body. Among the Chinese styles are the Kung Fu, Gung Fu, Wing Shu, ta uh, Taekwondo, and Hapkido are among the Korean styles. So again, you can put whatever name you want to call upon it, it all has the same ultimate roots. 
Sobriety is clearly a mental and moral exercise, indeed a spiritual exercise. In each practice session, there is a concerted effort to unite mind, body, spirit. Karate is founded on the scientific principles of body movements that develop the karate devotee into a healthy, well-coordinated person, both physically and mentally. This is what they're saying. Chinese karate masters consider karate to be an extension of their religion. It's a religious recruiting tool. If you really want to boil it down, what is Satan like about it? What is the biggest thing he likes about it? Well, it's a religious recruiting tool. It's one more religion that's going to take millions of people to hell, if you think about it. Okinawan karate masters consider it to be a way of life. They're quoted as saying, quote, It is rather an expression of life lived 24 hours a day, 365 days a year. Now, that's what we're supposed to be as a Christian. How can the two be compatible then? If this is a way of life that you're supposed to live 24-7, well, how can that be compatible with the Christian lifestyle that we're supposed to live 24-7? I don't know. I haven't figured it out. It can't be done, in other words. Going back to this quote, Indeed, the way of karate is a philosophy of life, a rich, rewarding philosophy. If carried through, past the boundaries of the obvious self-defense techniques, into the realm of the mind-searching discipline, within karate is the potential of a new person. A person huge in all the capabilities that will make him respected and confident. What, confident in self? That was a quote from the way of karate. So that is what they say. It's, it's confidence in self, is all it is. It's an abomination in God. It's, a, it's an abomination of God. No flesh will glory in my presence, as he said. But they say the opposite. That's how we know it's false. Compare it to the word of God, which is the standard. Karate is Zen. So says Master Oyama and many other karate masters. Zen is a school of Buddhism that has been called the religion of immediate reality. It's a quote. The aim of Zen is to awaken the student to his true self and thus bring about a degree of self-knowledge through inward meditation. Zen students seek the peace of mind through an enlightened awakening of intuitive wisdom. Intuitive. Like it's already there. You're just tapping into what's already there. This is much like the studies I've done on Oprah Winfrey and the secret and all that stuff, that name it and claim it, New Age name it and claim it stuff. Very, very, very closely tied in with the New Age movement, what we're talking about here today. Just one more confirmation of really all previous past studies that we've done. This intuitive wisdom that they feel is dormant now in all people. Oh, it's just dormant. And again, who gets the credit there? The, the, the human, the, the person. It's just, it's not God. It's, it's what's already there. We're just bringing it out so we can glorify self, ultimately. Zen meditation tries to achieve, quote, no-mindedness which may be acquired by concentration and special breathing exercises. Yes, and also open you up to total demonic infestation. As you empty your mind, something comes in there to fill the void. And it's demonic. Remember, Jesus even said that the, when the spirit goeth out of the body, he come back and he seeketh the body to inhabit. Okay, these demons seek at the body to inhabit. When you empty your mind, you're giving them fertile ground to come into. Guaranteed, that's why it's such a big objective. Emptying your mind. Karate, when combined with Zen meditation, is used to assist the student's quest for peace of mind and equanimity in the face of conflict and tension. Although many, especially here in the United States, tend to disregard much of the Zen Buddhist philosophy in their training, some impact of that philosophy is made upon every student of karate. This is because the Zen meditation and the yoga-like breathing exercises, whether for 30 seconds or for two hours before or after every practice session, are an integral part of the Oriental martial arts system. Is If one truly aspires to master the art of karate, he cannot ignore the spiritual implications. Zen meditation provides a false inner peace that is at best a counterfeit of the peace that only God can give. There is only one source of inner peace, peace according to the Bible, and that inner peace comes from the Holy Spirit that lives inside a true born-again Bible-believing Christian. Galatians 5.22 says, But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, meekness, goodness, faith, temperance. These are the fruits of the Spirit. We can choose between the self-control development by the Holy Spirit or the self-control of Zen. Again, you have to make your choice. And with self-control of Zen, as with any Eastern meditation technique, one could also be opening himself up to demonic activity. Well, that's a guarantee. Satan will make sure that you're opening yourself up to that. 
While God calls us to humility, the martial arts cater to the human pride. For even in gaining mastery over oneself through Zen, it is still recognized as an accomplishment of self. Now, what is the root of almost every single sin in the Bible? Self-centeredness. It was the root of the first sin of the Bible, where Lucifer looked up and said, I will be like God, I will ascend unto the Most High, I will you know, ascend to the sides of the North. It was pride. Self-centeredness. It's, if you think about every sin that there is, most of them you can boil it back to self-centeredness. Well, that's what this whole um, martial arts field and religion that goes along with it caters to. That's why it's very popular, because it caters to human pride. For even in gaining mastery over oneself through Zen, it is to recognize an accomplishment of self. That self-pride then manifests itself through a desire to prove one superior to others. There can only be one. Remember? There can be only one. Only one of the best. Although some proponents for a Christian martial artist do concede that karate has its roots in the occult, pagan or eastern religious philosophies, they also claim that the primary philosophy behind the martial arts actually originated in the Old Testament. Citing such passages as Psalm 140, 144 verse 1 where it says, The Lord teaches my, hand to, my hands to war, my fingers to fight, even going back all the way to the Garden of Eden. This is the ver they, they gave some other proof texts here that were so absurd, I'm not even going to read them. Because I don't see how you could even possibly use those. That was the best one I could find. But again, you have to compare this with what Jesus Christ's teachings were in the New Testament as well. It's not compatible. Okay, when you're, when you're in the Old Testament, when Israel was going out to war with the Philistines, they were in a different dispensation there. They were commanded to go to war and to slay and to kill and these types of things. A lot of the people, that, that, particularly when they went in the Promised Land, whatever they were fighting, these were giants. These were like the Nephilim of Genesis 6. So, again, different time period we're dealing with there as well. There is a, in the... Book, Christian Martial Arts, and I'm going to make sure I get this one, I'm no, just kidding. Christian Martial Arts by Tottingham and Tottingham, uh, page 2 it says, Therefore, according to these ad advocates, Satan made inroads into the true Bible-based martial arts. This is a quote from this book. So Satan made the inroads into the true Bible-based martial arts, capturing them for himself, and that all we need to do now is to reclaim them. It's just like Christian rock. Well, God created music, and we just need to go in and re reclaim that rock and roll for Christianity. It doesn't work that way. I, 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 you, could, you could extrapolate that to everything. What, did God create drugs, so we just need to reclaim that for, you know? Well, the poppy plant makes opium, and God made the poppy plant, so we need to just recapture that opium for the drug addicts, and, 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 and we need to Christianize it. It's what they're doing with everything. This is just one of the many things they're, they're doing that with. So, we, we go... They're saying we need to capture this true Bible-based martial arts, capture them for himself, and then we need to reclaim them and change them from an Asiatic philosophy to a true Bible-centered Christian philosophy. This, of course, is the same logic men use to Christianize any worldly pagan or occult philosophy or practice, whether it be astrology, where they have the gospel and the stars now, or psychology, or eastern medicine, or magic, or pyramidology, or graphology, or numerology, the logic goes on and on and on. You can try to Christianize anything you want, but if it doesn't line up with the word of God, you, you don't want to try to Christianize it at all. It cannot be done. The violence associated with the karate smacks of anything but Christian as well. Legendary karate masters were reputed to have superhuman powers, including the ability to kill small birds with a yell. Whoa! They could kill small birds with a yell? The, and it was called the Shout of Doom. Now, as an example, I'm going to have Doug give us a little demonstration here, the Shout of Doom. So, so I'm... <laughs> The shout of doom. I, I love it. Um, I was up at um, Pastor Slattery's meeting speaking last time, and he has a he puts on these meetings uh, twice a month up there, and uh, he has this little box, <laughs> and it's it costs some money to put these things on. It costs some money to rent out the room, and, and you know to do all the stuff, and, and it's just a donation box. He doesn't, you know, 
it's just back there if you want to put some money in the box, that type of thing. You know, it's not, we don't keep track of anything. We don't let our right hand know what our left hand's doing. He, he does it in a very biblical way. But I love what he refers to that box as. He, he says most people, when they come up to the box, they, they come up to it and they get this real sad expression on their face. So he calls it the box of despair. I, I, just, I just thought that was great. Or I, I like, if I had one, I'd call it the box of woe. You know, just it's something that really makes people sad, you know, and, and stuff. And So anyway, um, anyway, so that was, and then there was another thing, a secret knowledge of how to lightly touch a spot on the body to cause death. This is the touch of death. So Lisa, can you demonstrate the touch of, okay, just kidding, teasing. And then the ability to penetrate any adversary's body with a bare hand and withdraw his still beating heart. Now, that's a practical thing we as Christians need to know. Yeah, I mean, hey, what's not the like? I mean, come on. But, you know, again, I talk about these things, and, and they're, they're, it's almost hilarious to talk about. But, you know, this is part of the package that you get with martial arts. It's part of the package. The very nature of these violent forms of expression runs counter to the Word of God. How, then, can any Christian justify his involvement in karate or any other martial arts, he really can't. Not even by claiming that such involvement is purely for self-defense, exercise, or to learn discipline, let alone justifying it for evangelism purposes. There are other methods by which these results may be obtained, methods not associated with the harmful violence and false doctrine. Um, so, that was from Biblical Discernment Ministries, uh, 4 of 1992. And the last thing, this is, this is what got me started in this, this last email I'm going to be reading you from, and um, I'm going to just read this first paragraph, and then I'm going to give a little testimony here. This was my comment when I first put this particular thing out. But below, or what we're going to be getting into, is an abbreviated version of an article I found on the internet regarding a book entitled, Cook Sul Wan, A Brief History. Now, Cook Sul Wan is another form of martial arts. Again, we talk about karate, we talk about kung fu, and, and, and a lot of people say, yeah, but this one's not a cult. Oh, okay, please. Where was the foundation? Where, where did it stem from? Where did it start? Is where we ha what we need to look at. This, this particular form of martial arts is no different than any other. Okay, it's called Kuk Sulwan. Please bear in mind that these are not my words. Now, there's a reason I'm talking about this one. I'm going to give you that in a second. So please bear in mind that what we're going to be talking about right now are not my words, but the words of qualified men who are explaining what Kuk Sulwan and really the martial arts are. They're far more qualified than me. And you can't accuse me, if I'm quoting people that are involved in martial arts, you can't really accuse me of having bias. This is what they're saying, not me. This is not biased research, as these men are the very ones promoting this martial art. The evidence speaks for itself, and as you will see, it is overwhelming in regard to the contradiction this martial art and all the others presents to the Bible-believing Christian. I provide much further documentation beyond this initial excerpt, so please re read this article in its entirety. It's not my intention to attack any individual or to hinder the work of the Lord in any way, shape, or form. Actually, my goal is quite the opposite, and it lines up with the biblical tenet that the truth shall set you free. I ask myself, if I were being deceived, which I openly admit before the Lord that I am not above being deceived, again, are, are any of us at any one time above being deceived if we think we're not then that's pride okay but would i want someone to come to me and tell me the truth if i were being deceived or would it be better for me to remain in deception and be destroyed for lack of knowledge according to hosea 4 6 now i'm not even saying let's let's just leave the salvation issue aside let's just say somebody is being deceived that they're a real born again christian but they're being deceived as long as they stay in that deception is what they're doing for the Lord being hindered? Yeah, sure it is. Okay, so this is a tool of Satan to limit your ability to truly work for the Lord properly. Okay, this is just, at bare minimum, that's what this is. At maximum, it's something, used, it's something that's being used to take millions to hell. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians 2.15, But he that is spiritual judgeth all things. Now this isn't hypocritical judgment, where Jesus talked about, you know, judge not lest ye be judged. That's if you have a beam in your own eye and you're judging the speck in your brothers. He that is spiritual judgeth all things. Jesus Christ said judge righteous judgment. What we're doing today is we're judging this matter. Now, what happened to me, oh, this was about three to four years ago. 
I got a call from somebody at a church that I had attended at one time, but I had since left there because of the apostasy. And there was a man at this church that was teaching karate. Actually, it was this Kuk Sulwan that we're going to be talking about. And evidently what had happened is, he had been a member of this church for a long time, good friends with the pastor, this type of stuff, but he actually had come in there and wanted to start teaching a class on this. And I had one of the uh, women at the church call me, who was a patient of mine, and she said, you know, listen, this is going on, and my son's in this, and, you know, they're doing all these meditative breathing exercises at the start, and there, there was a, two or three really huge, huge red flags. And I said, whoa, I said, this is not good. I said, this is, no, I would not let this go on in the church. I would get my son out of there. Well, she went to the pastor, and she, I think I forwarded her a, this information that I'm giving you today about this particular offshoot of uh, martial arts, Cook So One, and she presented it before them, and the church, I believe, shut it down. Well, oh boy, when he got wind of this, now this guy has his own dojo. Okay, he's like, you know, 8th or whatever, 7th, 8th degree black belt in this particular discipline. He's got his own dojo. You're talking about this guy is you know, hook, line, and sinker into this stuff, sees nothing wrong with it, would be absolutely infuriated if he heard this particular study. And when he got this information, he went ballistic. He calls me on the phone. He's just screaming at me. I couldn't even understand what the guy was saying. He was just screaming, ah, 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 screaming at me, telling me, get down to his dojo. He's going to show me that this is this is uh, about integrity and respect and, 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 and ha showing respect and... Uh, I said, you know what, I'm not going to give his name, but I said, you know what, I said, it doesn't really matter what you tell me, I don't understand how it, how, what all you're telling me undoes all the information that you have in your lap that you saw from me. It doesn't undo that information, okay, there's way too many scriptures that we have to contemplate, way too many red flags about this, I don't care if you're learning respect and all of a sudden, the devil's always going to make something appear Good. If he can, oh yes, you're learning discipline and you're learning respect. You know, there's a billboard locally, um, not a billboard, but they have like these little signs up and it says something like, got discipline, and it shows this, this little kid doing a karate move, and, and this, is the, this is the big thing. Kids are such, so many kids today are such little devils, because the parents have let the secular education system and the TV and the video games raise their kids. There's no discipline at all. And they turn out like devils, and they're like, oh, what do we do to little Johnny? He's got no discipline. We'll put him in karate. He'll get some discipline. Yeah, they put, they put little Johnny in karate, and he becomes twice the child of hell that he was before. Yeah, he's got discipline, but now he's got all the demons that go along with the martial art. But he's learning respect. That's all that matters. Yeah, Doug just brought up a good point. Luciferians and people involved in high-level occult also believe in, in many of these same things. Respect and, and these types of things toward toward certain people or your elders or, or things of that nature. So, this guy was just screaming at me on the phone. I couldn't really get a word in edgewise. And I stayed on the phone with him. And I, and I said, I said, he kept, you know, he kept trying to get me to come down to his dojo for me to be convinced. And I'm like, I'm not going to the devil's den so you can try to convince me. I said, can you disprove this information? He finally just hung up on me. See, that's how a guy like that deals with problems. He calls and screams and, and thinks he's going to intimidate me into submission. And I didn't. I just stood there. He ended up hanging up on me. <laughs> Never heard from him again. So, you know, I, I just... I've, I've, had my, I've, I've had a lot of experience with this stuff. Not only have I been involved with it, but I've been on both sides of this. Thank God they stopped teaching that class, at least at the time, at that particular church. So this, this excerpt that I'm reading is, is entitled, Cook So One, A Brief History. And it's got like, oh my word, four, four different guys have contributed to this, and all these are experts on Cook So One, this particular form of martial arts. So remember, as we go through this portion of the teaching, we are presenting a discussion on the martial arts from the experts in the martial arts, um, and this is what they're openly admitting to. So we'll start out here. It says, in this, the first of three articles on Kuk Sowon, although we focus on the history of Korean martial arts, to do so, we must explore the history of Korea. 
For the country and the martial arts are inextricably interwoven. See, they're admitting the history of their countries are inextricably woven, not only with religion, but with the martial arts, and the martial arts are also interwoven with the religious aspect, the Zen Buddhism and all this other stuff. Modern Korea is as much a product of its martial arts as its martial arts are a product of the country. You see how important it is to them? We can come here and Christianize it all day long. It doesn't take away this. The foundation, if the foundations be destroyed, what can the righteous do? Then it goes on to say, what shall we see emerge is the Korean martial art, martial spirit. They call it the martial spirit. Now remember, mar martial as in um, Mars, which is the god of war, fifth planet from the sun, the red planet, the god of war, that's where we get martial, M-A-R. We see, so what we shall see is the Korean martial spirit that has endured throughout, which is the spirit of war. The roots and the foundation of Kuk Sul Wan. The names Kuk Sul and Kuk Sul Wan were coined and first used in 1958 by Shu, this guy named Shu Huwaki, when he found the, founded the art and represents a uniquely comprehensive study of the, of the traditional Korean martial arts. Although when one hears the term martial arts, one would naturally think of physical skill. However, with all, however, with Kuk Sa Wan and all the other martial arts, there is an implicit meaning that goes much further to include the cultural, philosophical, mental, and spiritual heritage of the Korean martial arts in Psyche. Talk about not fleeing all appearance of evil. It's inextricably interwoven, it said. You can't separate the one from the other. No matter how much a Christian would want to try to put a Christian veneer on this. The legend, now this is entitled The Legend of Tan Gun. This is from 2333 BC. As legend has it, a god named Hoan Jung decided he wished to live in the human world. No oh, good. And shows... Taibak Sun Mountain, one of the three highest peaks in the Ever White Mountain Range of North Korea, as a suitable place to come down and live. Doesn't this sound like Genesis 6, where the sons of God saw the daughters of men, that they were fair and they took them wise all they chose? Hmm, kind of weird. Now, understand, this is, this, is, this is the foundation, what they're giving is the foundation of Kuk So Wan. So, we have this God, lowercase g, what did they call these, these, these fallen angels when they came down? They thought they were gods. This is where we get all of the ancient um, Grecian and all these, these ancient you know, um, myths of the gods and stuff like Zeus and Apollo and all this other stuff. This is the oriental version of their same myths. Or, or not really myths because there's probably a lot of truth to this. But in other, in other words, these fallen angels had come down and had done this, and this is one of their legends about this. And then it says, When this God descended from heaven, he appeared under a sandalwood tree. He brought with him 3,000 loyal heavenly subjects, who were to be responsible for teaching the people a number of useful arts and crafts, which included farming and healing, and I believe it includes these martial arts, originally. I don't ever remember God saying in the Bible that he taught this, taught them how to do all these martial arts. But isn't that funny, that if, if we look, one of the common themes of this, when these fallen angels came down, is that they imparted this knowledge, primarily and firstly, to the women that they had taken to wife. This is where, and, and, and this is where, when we talk about these fallen angels that came down, and I've done many studies on this, on Genesis 6, and we've touched on the book of Enoch, I haven't said it's canon of scripture, but it did present some very interesting enlightenment, about the true meanings of things, when we look at that, the sons of God saw the daughters of men that they were fair, they took them wise all their children, and then these giants were born unto them. If we look at the origins of witchcraft, we see the first witches were actually the wives of these giants, of not the giants, but of the fallen angels. These were the ones that they took to them wife. These were the first witches. These fallen angels came down and taught these women how to use enchantments, it says root cuttings, things of this nature. Okay, they taught them witchcraft. And here we have this supposed God coming down and bringing with him these heavenly subjects who were responsible for teaching the people a number of useful arts and crafts. Now we know this is a devil. We know this is a fallen angel that they're in reference to here.
Do you think that he's going to teach them how to get closer to the Lord Jesus Christ and observe the word of God? If he was doing that, why didn't it say it? Didn't, because he wasn't. Whatever this thing was teaching, it was evil. Okay, there may have been some practical applications to what he was doing. But ultimately, it was evil. I'll just end there on, on that particular. It goes into this whole other rigmarole. Then this is the next part. And it says, Bull Kayo Mulsol, the Buddhist martial arts. Through history, religion has influenced every major civilization. Religion, this is what they're saying, has influenced every major civilization in the world. And Korea is no exception. The oldest form of religion in Korea is known as shamanism or animism, based on the belief that spirits dwell within the forces of nature as well as in inanimate objects. Uh, this could also be getting into the, into the realm of pantheism and, and uh, these types of things. One popular example of this belief is the worship of the mountain god or the spirit, which is symbolized by a white bearded old man with a tiger at his feet. Going further... Now, remember, this is the origins of Kuk Sulwan. This is what we're talking about here. This next part is entitled Silla, S-I-L-L-A. And it said, introduced by the Korean monk, Adu, who studied in China, Confucianism and Taoism were also introduced about the same time, but were destined not to have the same influence as Buddhism until much later. So we're talking about three false religions, Buddhism, Confucianism, and Taoism. However, both of these systems of philosophical thought were to make a significant contributions to the overall Korean martial arts psyche. See how instricably interwoven this is? They're proving it. With the introduction of Buddhism into Korea came Bul Kai Mul Sol, which is the Buddhist martial arts, which were to contribute greatly to the development of the Korean martial arts. See, so you can't, you can't use the argument, yeah, but this one particular sect of martial arts, it was pure, it was, it was Christian from the beginning, we've taken it back for the Lord. It was never the Lord's, He never gave it. Going further, this is called the Order of Hawa Rang. The influence of Buddhism on Korean martial arts can perhaps be most easily and directly traced to the role played now by the legendary Buddhist monk, Wan Kuang De Sa, in the formation of the fighting elite known as Hawa Rang. The formation of this elite warrior corps has an interesting history, which is now described before detailed attention is paid to Hawa Rang. Now, before we go any further, I have a comment here. I've posted below in this particular article. Now, what I'm going to try to do is make this available as a PDF. I'm going to try to put all this together so you can read it all in one PDF document if you want to go back and re reference it. And this will be posted with the teaching that, I'll be put, that will be put up on Sermon Audio. Next week, I'm going to probably be talking about acupuncture and yoga. Okay, This week, we're talking about more of the martial arts. So, below are some Christian-oriented explanations of some occultic terms and symbols associated with a high number of martial arts, including this Kuk Sul Wan. I present these so as we as Christians are not destroyed for lack of knowledge. The yin-yang. What is this yin-yang? You know, the, the whole yin-yang symbol. It's a Taoist concept. It's used in the New Age movement, holding that the universe consists of two opposite energy forces, positive and negative, male and female. Both are necessary, and both must be harmonized for proper function. This yin and yang also flows through the human body, so that a balance is required to maintain health. Many New Age holistic health techniques, such as acupuncture, are based on attempts to balance this alleged energy, or qi. When all is balanced, the yin and yang harmonize and the body works properly. That's why I don't advise anybody to do any of this stuff. Okay? I, trust me, I've been there and done it. I'm a board-certified chiropractor. I'm also a board-certified acupuncturist. Okay? I don't do it anymore. I destroyed my, my diploma, the whole nine yards. I pretty much put my money where my mouth is on this. But I, when I first got into it, the guy that led me to the Lord, although he said he was a Christian, he was involved in all this New Age stuff. It's all I ever knew. So I became a board-certified acupuncturist. I was doing all kinds of stuff with kinesiology and, and just crazy stuff I was into. But God eventually took me out of all of it. I praise the Lord. I'll talk a little bit more about that next week. Then we have the concept of Taoism, or T-A-O-I-S-I-M is how it's spelled. China, this is the Chinese philosophy teaching that there is no personal God. Well, that's like the overriding force behind almost all of martial law. Or, or, martial, martial law. <laughs> martial, yeah, that too. Martial arts is Taoism. Well, what is it? 
It's the Chinese philosophy teaching that there's no, there's no personal God. Well, does that sound a little bit contradictory to Scripture? I would say so. This is why this conflict that's there is so huge. I don't care how you would try to Christianize it. They believe there's no personal God. All is the impersonal Tao, similar to the impersonal God force of pantheism and Hinduism. The Tao, or T-A-O is how it's spelled, is composed of the conflicting opposites, the yin and the yang, which should be balanced or harmonized through yoga, meditation, etc., to promote spiritual wholeness. See, it's a very man-centered. It's about what I do. So it's like every other false religion. It's all about earning your way to wherever you're trying to get to. And then we have the concept of meditation, entering an altered state of consciousness by the use of a mantra, yoga, deep relaxation techniques, controlled breathing or visualization. Again, we've got this seeping into the churches now like crazy. A lot of it entered in because they brought in these martial arts classes. Because this is where, you know, a lot of this entered in initially. A little leaven, leaven at the whole lump. It's going to permeate. It's like dough. Put a little leaven in the dough. It permeates through the whole lump. It's bad doctrine. This is bad doctrine. Often linked to Eastern metaphysical philosophies, the New Age and or the Eastern religions, these techniques promote the emptying of the mind or the suspension of critical thinking. Again, empty that mind. They just love it. This is different. From the biblical meditation where we are, one is encouraged to meditate on the word of God. You're not emptying the mind, you're meditating, you're filling it with the word of God. Faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. So, where they all, so shall a young man cleanse his way? By taking heed thereto according to thy word. Thy word have I hid in my heart, that I might not sin against thee. Psalm 119 verse 9 and 119 verse 11. So, the meditation of the Bible is totally different. We're supposed to meditate on the Word of God, His attributes, His Word, employing the whole mind, like it talks about in Joshua 1.8 and Luke 10.27. Now, the New Age is a recent and developing belief system in the North American, encompassing thousands of autonomous and sometimes contradictory beliefs. Remember, God is not the author of confusion, yet many times they contradict their own stuff. But thousands of sometimes contradictory beliefs, organizations, and events, generally the New Age borrows its theology from the pantheistic Eastern religious systems and its practices from the 19th century Western occultism. The term New Age is used therein as an umbrella term to describe organizations which seem to exhibit one or more of the following beliefs. Number one, all is one. All reality is part of the whole. Everything, number two, everything is God and God is everything. I may start to wax poetic here, so watch out. Just kidding. Yeah, the kundalini serpent spirit is, is definitely rising. I, I feel it. Anyway, and then three, man is a god or part of a god. Well, isn't that what Satan said to Eve? You shall be as gods in the Garden of Eden? It's the first carrot that Satan ever put out in front of somebody. Worked pretty good. You shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. That's well, the same thing. Appeals to man's pride. And then number four, man never dies, but continues to live through reincarnation. Oh, what a lie from the pit of hell that is. The Bible says it is appointed unto man once to die, and after this the judgment. The Bible says absent from the body is to be present with the Lord, if you're a born-again believer. Number five, another thing it teaches, man can create his own reality and or values through transformed consciousness or altered states of consciousness. Or just more and more lies. So, now, below... I'm posting here in, in this particular article, and I'm reading from this. I said, below is a lecture study I found being done by an occultist named Quan Jang Nim. Notice that he speaks on numerous different false religions. Confucianism, Taoism, Shamanism, etc. Please take special note that amid this whole cultic expose, one whole day of his lecture are devoted to Kuk Sul Wan, which is this particular martial art he specializes in, of the Korean variety. The connection between the martial arts and the New Age are totally undeniable. And according to 2 Thess Corinthians 6.14, what fellowship have Christ with Belial or light with darkness? That's why we're not to be unequally yoked together with unbelievers. You can't help to be unequally yoked if you're doing this stuff. The Lord tells us in verse 17 of 2 Corinthians 6, to come out from among them and be separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing. And I will receive you. Well, do you think this might be something that might hinder your prayers if you're doing it? You're, you're yoked up with unbelievers. You haven't come out from among them. And you're in pride and rebellion. You're against God's word. And you expect to get your prayers answered? 
The Bible says, if I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear me. Psalm 66, verse 18. If I regard iniquity. When you're participating in martial arts, are you not regarding iniquity in your heart? Well, the God says he's not going to, I can't understand why I don't get my prayers answered. Well, this could explain it right here. Now, understand, we're, these things that we're going to be talking about, you could substitute any martial art for this. Any. So, in this thing, this occultist is talking about, first thing he talks about is Confucianism. And in this particular day, one, it's etiquette and respect. Now, this is, again, the big lie that you get with the martial arts and with all these other religious systems. Oh, they teach honor and, and respecting your elders and discipline and all these things. But this is no excuse. You know, the devil can present all kinds of things that, are, that look good on the outside. But inwardly, it's death. There is a way which seemeth right unto a man, but the end of the ways of death. But this is the excuse that Christian martial artists use. The respect, that's about the, the, the only thing that guy could tell me when I got into that, when he got into that argument with me on the phone, the guy that I told you about, the 7th or 8th degree, Cook So Wan, black belt guy, that was, you know, a church member for all these years, and evidently had no conviction that it was wrong all these years. Why? Because God's heart, his heart's been hardened. The Bible says, for the Spirit speaketh expressly that in the latter times, some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. That's exactly what we're talking about. A seducing spirit and a doctrine of devils, speaking lies and hypocrisy. That's what he was doing to me. When he was trying to justify this evil martial art, he was speaking lies and hypocrisy. He was attacking me as a hypocrite. He was acting as though he was doing God's service, as like a hypocrite would. He was attacking me, screaming at me, the Bible says, if you see your brother overtaken in an heir, go to such an one in a spirit of meekness, lest thou also be tempted. Was he coming to me in a spirit of meekness? I get a lot of people that email me and they're just jumping down my throat right off the bat. I say, you know, if you're a Christian, you violated this scriptural principle. You haven't come to me in a spirit of meekness. It says, go to such an one in a spirit of meekness, lest thou also be tempted. Okay? I, I get that all the time. You know? But yeah, he came to me just screaming. Couldn't back it up biblically. All he could say is, no, we teach respect and discipline. And Okay, so that justifies everything. Okay, that, that we'll, we'll just overlook everything else we've just talked about today because of that. But that's what they want you to do. And because I had exposed this for what it was, he was violent. The spirits that were guiding him, the seducing spirits and doctrines of devils that were inside him and controlling him, came out to the surface. And now all of a sudden, it became, well, I can't convince this guy. I'll try to intimidate him. A lot of people use this, this tactic. So the Spirit speaketh expressly, and in the latter times some should depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils, speaking lies and hypocrisy, and having, what's the ultimate end? Having their conscience seared with a hot iron. That man's conscience was seared with a hot iron, because you couldn't tell him anything. His mind was made up. Don't confuse him with the facts. Well, he has his whole life invested in that dojo. You're right. And a lot of Christians are in the same boat. Well, I've got my life invested in this denomination. I'm a Southern Baptist, bless God, and even though it's a 501c3 entity yoked up with the government, and we're reading some false perversion, and we've got karate in our thing, and we've got a yoga class, and we've got all these worldly programs, bless God, i got my life invested here, and I don't care what you tell me, you're not going to convince me any different that what I'm doing is wrong. Have it your way. You're the one that has to answer to God for it. You, you're the one. So, the next thing he taught on uh, this next date was this Hawal Rosh Do, whatever. And what is that entitled? The Codes of Honor. And again, you see the nice, wonderful little veneer. This is how they start out. Confucianism, etiquette, and respect. This other thing, Codes of Honor. And it says, we shall look briefly at the history of Hawal Rosh Do, the way of the flowering youth. Again, I may wax poetic. The elite fighting force of early Korea who can be compared with the samurai warriors of Japan. See, they all have their different flavors of this. We will, however, focus on the codes of honor they live by. The five commandments and the nine virtues. And again, this is the justification that you're typically going to get when you try to present this truth to somebody. It doesn't undo everything we just talked about. The obvious scriptural warnings. Then we have, the next thing he's talking about is Taoism. The Oriental philosophical theories. 
On a practical level, we will learn the martial art way of speaking without talking. Whatever that means. But you see how this is all tied together? It's all inextricably tied together. And they admitted it. Then the next time, we're going to talk about shamanism. That's something a little more evil. We softened them up with the etiquettes and the codes of virtue and the codes of honor. Now we're going to get a little more occultic. We're going to kind of let our, sh our true colors show a few days later when we talk about shamanism. Now when I think of a shaman, I think of a witch doctor. But it's okay, evidently. Shamanism or tribal religion of the ancient Korea. Shamanism is the oldest form of religion known to Korea. They're admitting it. And it's inextricably tied to all the martial arts? Sure. China, Japan, don't matter. Flavor of the week. And shamanism dates way back to antiquity. It almost certainly has influenced the psyche of the Korean people. And not least the martial art and not least the martial art warriors who inhabited those times. It is based on the belief that spirits dwell within the forces of nature as well as in inanimate objects. Well they also dwell these evil spirits dwell within people primarily. In this talk we shall explore the legend of the mountain god and discuss the martial aspects of the shaman adepts walking and dancing on knives and swords. Hey, that sounds pretty Christian to me. I mean, I'm sure Paul had a very similar thing, you know, when he was preaching. and you know, I mean, you, you, try, just try to extrapolate this into true Bible-believing Christianity. But hey, this is what you're yoked up with. If you're, if you're uh, into the martial arts stuff, no, no, brother, we've taken it back for Christ. It was never ours to begin with. Buddhism is the next thing he talked about. The philosophy and meditation. He's, he says the sheer depth, richness, and influence of the Buddhist teaching is not to be underestimated in relation to the traditional Korean martial arts. From the very first day a student walks into the Dojang, the Buddhist philosophy and teaching permeate many different areas of Kuksu Wan training. They're absolutely, totally admitting it. Now, if this is your foundation, you can come out from that and say, well, I'm going to do it a Christian way. What was the foundation? It says Buddha, Buddhist philosophy and teaching permeate many different areas of the Kuk Sowan training from the very first day the student walks into the dojo. How can you get around this? And then it says, we shall discuss briefly the life of Buddha and his philosophies focusing on the 108 ways to enlightenment Evidently, one of those ways was being a really big glutton, because you always see those Buddha statues, he's always like way overweight. He might need to go to like Curves or one of those, I don't know, fitness places, I guess. But he has 108 ways to enlightenment. Oh, yes, yes. <sighs> On a practical level, we will practice the Metta Bahavana, or the meditation of the universal loving kindness with 10,000 candles. <laughs> Oh, no, this doesn't sound too new age. I'm not making this up. I'm reading this straight from the itinerary of this particular, uh, or schedule of this particular guy that's going to be speaking about these things. So, you know, after I heard about the, the, the meditation of the universal loving kindness with 10,000 candles, I broke down. I signed up. I, I, I couldn't help myself. I just, I was convinced. Just teasing. Okay, little humor there. Anyway, and then we're, we're going to talk about Zen Zhu. The Oriental Medicine and Martial Arts. Oriental Medicine? Yeah. Oriental Medicine is one of the oldest and most effective forms of medicine known to humanity and has been used for over 2,500 years by the Oriental people. This is why I caution people about acupuncture and the Oriental stuff because so much of it is inextricably tied in with their religion. Just like the modern day pharmaceutical company companies, when you look up the word pharmaceutical, it's the root Pharmacia is the root word for sorcery in the Bible. You've got to be careful of this stuff. It's mind-altering substances most of the time. So, throughout the ages, martial art warriors have learned and used this form of healing to assist their survival in an inhospitable world. In this talk, we shall discuss the history of this time-honored therapy and its relationship with the martial arts. So now they're even tying the oriental medicine together with the martial arts. And we know it's tied in with the religious system. Little leaven, leaven at the whole lump. This is not something you want to mess with. You don't know what you're possibly opening yourself up to. When I did all these techniques as a chiropractor, I was into kinesiology and acupuncture. And I, I mean, pride was another thing. I'm thinking, man, I'm going to have so many degrees. I'm going to have more degrees than a thermometer when I'm done. You know, I've got, I got this and I got that. And I had these certifications. I was actually being groomed to teach this one particular 
a kinesiology technique called contact reflux analysis. We were in the number one clinic in the state of Florida that promoted this one particular product line, me and this other chiropractor. And we were, I mean, we were really doing good. But it was pride. And I had all these, I had all these different certifications and degrees. And here I was, 24 years old as a doctor, and I'm thinking, oh man, I'm the man, and all this other stuff. And I'm telling you, it was really prideful thing for me, you know. And uh, God had to really do a lot of humbling because I was so far, I had elevated myself fo- so far up that it took a lot of extraordinary humbling, you know, and not to say I've, I've attained or anything that I'm perfect. I'm just saying it. I had to really be taken to the woodshed for literally years. The Bible says, whom the Lord loveth, he also chasteneth. And if you be without chastisement, you're bastards. What is a bastard? An illegitimate son. So I was taken to the woodshed. I know about the chastening of the Lord. Of the Lord. And um, you get into this stuff as a born-again Christian, he will chasten you because you're his kid. Now, if you're doing this, what concerns me is the so-called, quote, Christians that are doing all this stuff, and they've been doing it for years, and they have absolutely no conviction that it's wrong. Huh, that's weird. And they're not chastened of God. They're getting along fine. They're prospering. How could God prosper a true born-again Christian if he had his own dojo? He's teaching something that's contradictory to the word of God, and yet he's calling evil good and good evil. How can he? He's not. He's not saved. Fruit of the Spirit's love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, meekness, goodness, faith, temperance, all these things that we're supposed to have as Christians, we're supposed to be chastened by God when we do wrong. These types of things, we're supposed to try to be pursuing truth, we're, we're to be as good Bereans, study the scriptures daily, rightly divide the word of truth, mark them which cause division and offenses contrary to the doctrine which ye have learned, avoid them, for they that are such serve not our Lord Jesus Christ, but their own belly, and by good words and fair speeches deceive the hearts of the simple. We're supposed to do all these things, and yet I see all these Christians that are involved in this stuff and a lot of other things they shouldn't be involved with, and there's no conviction whatsoever that what they're doing wrong. No, no, I'm the bad guy. I'm the bad guy for giving them the truth. This overwhelming, obvious truth. I'm the bad guy, though. I'm the one wrong. They can't refute what I'm saying because it's so overwhelming, and it's not really me saying it. And yet there's no conviction of God on their life that they might be wrong. You know, that's scary because, again, we go back to 1 Timothy 4.1, where it talks about the Spirit speaketh expressly, the Holy Spirit, huh? seducing spirits, doctrines of devils, Speaking lies and hypocrisy and having their conscience seared with a hot iron? Once you get your conscience seared with a hot iron, I don't know how you get it unseared. And if, if your conscience has been seared with a hot iron, do you think they're going to be convicted about anything? No. I don't think so. Why? They've given heed to seducing spirits and doctrine of devils. Evil men and seducers waxing worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. Have they been given over to the strong delusion that God said he was going to send in Second Thessalonians chapter 2 that we read in the last part? I don't know. All I can say is I'm not their judge, but it sure seems to me as though they are really deceived and they are absolutely 100% content to stay in that deception. That's scary stuff. Okay, so continuing further, and we're almost through here, uh, this next part that he talks about is called grasping the wind. Understanding pressure points. And it says martial arts training can encompass many different aspects. It is considered that to know how to find an opponent's most vulnerable spots and to subdue them and disarm them with the least amount of effort and injury to all concerned is the ultimate application of the higher level of training and is the understanding of the combative arts. Again, I think we have some conflicts here with true Bible-believing Christianity, particularly in a lot of the teachings of Jesus Christ. Okay, we've already covered that. And then the last thing he finally talks about is the Oriental Martial Art Philosophical Theory. There are three basic principles that lie at the heart of Kuk Sul Wan, which is this martial art that we've been talking about. And one is called the Water Principle, and another one's called the Circular Principle, and the other one's called the Harmony Principle. And again, these are all very New Age type terms, but you can see how it's totally interwoven into everything else that we've been talking about. There's no way you can possibly separate this. Okay, So, that's the end of the study on martial arts. Uh, hopefully it's been a blessing to you. I'm sure some are totally pulling their hair out and wanting to kill me and these types of things. But, you know, again, am I therefore become your enemy because I tell you the truth? Because I believe, at bare minimum, I mean, come on, flee all appearance of evil. 
err on the side of safety, you know, wherefore come out from among them and be separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing. There's so much unclean that we've just talked about here. So many things that are just contradictory to the word of God. I mean, I don't know how much more I could show you in regard to this. And I'm going to go into the same thing on acupuncture and yoga in the coming weeks. So I'll go ahead and close this out in a word of prayer today. Heavenly Father, we do thank you for this time that you've given us. And Lord God, all your goodness and mercy. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, I do pray, God, that you would forgive us for any and all sins we've committed in any way, shape, or form. And that, Lord God, the words of our mouth and the meditations of our heart would be pleasing in your sight, O Lord. And Lord God, I do pray that that we would forgive any that have sinned against us, that we would have mercy upon them, Lord God. And I do pray, God, for your mercy upon us in the body of Christ, upon our family members, those people that are around us. I do pray, God, that you would use, Lord God, the people that are listening to this in the body of Christ mightily for your glory. pray, God, that through the body of Christ, you would lead many people to the Lord, that your name would be glorified, that the truth would go forth with power and might, that the Holy Spirit convicting power would be upon it. We praise you, Lord God. We thank you for all your goodness and mercy. We ask all these things in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. We pray. Amen.